everybody, welcome. So as always, we begin with uh, an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the people of the greater Kulin nations, who are the traditional custodians of the land that Monash University, our digital host, is located on. Although, of course, you're all tuning in from all over Australia and possibly internationally. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country all across Australia as many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to Indigenous peoples who are part of our parlour community. So my name's Jill Matheson. I'm the numbers nerd for parlour. And I'm a researcher also at the XYX Lab at Monash University. And this series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, is an ongoing collaboration between Monash University and Parla. And this is our eighth event. We've been going for eight weeks, uh, every Friday at this time. And we'll, we look into architecture as a profession, a discipline, and a pra practice, and how this will be and is affected by this pandemic um, and as those of us in Victoria are locked down again. This week, our guest is Gordana Milosevska, and I hope I said that right. And what we are focusing on today is financial literacy in the profession, what architects need to know more about as both practice directors and employees. Uh, Justine will introduce Gordana and the topic in more detail in a moment, but my role is to set out some of our the rules that we've developed before we begin, uh, which will be relevant for those of you who haven't been here before. So we ask that you keep your microphone on mute unless we ask you to ask a question. But we would like you to keep your um, camera on if you're willing to do that and if you've got the bandwidth, um, because this is a community event and where we come together. And so we really like to be able to see all your faces and for you to be able to see one another's faces, uh, plus the odd pet. So do leave your camera on if you're able. Uh, so the format for the session is Q&A. It's informal, uh, but we hope informative. Justine and I will ask questions and keep things moving along, but we really welcome questions from the floor throughout. But please put, first put your question in the chat and we will select questions and then ask the person who has posed that question to actually ask it themselves to kind of um, turn on the ca their camera and microphone. Uh, but also, if you want to put any observations or experiences into the chat, please um, feel free to do that. We're very happy to, for it to be a kind of parallel narrative and it's worked really well uh, so far. Uh, we won't get to all the questions, sadly, but, um, but any of the questions that you ask uh, will help to inform the topics of subsequent questions. So, okay, now I'm going to throw it back to Justine to introduce uh, today's guest and topic. Right, thanks, Jill. Hi, everybody. Um, as I said, very nice to see lots of our friends out there and some new people too, who we hope will become our friends. Um, so today, uh, as Jill said, we're turning our attention to financial literacy, something I, that I know I feel like I should know a lot more about than I do. Um, and I think I'm probably typical. There's a widespread idea that in the, the profession as a whole could be better at business and that financial matters are all too often pushed to one side as um, architects strive to make good work. Um, I really do think that better business and financial management also will help uh, make it easier to improve equity in the profession. So there's lots of reasons for having this discussion. And of course, uh, financial matters are very pressing right now um, as we face an economic downturn that we are unsure of the scale and scope of as yet, but is certainly looking um, to be rather worrying. Um, there's also a, a small but growing number of architects who are studying business. And um, this morning, Emilio Fuscaldo sent me a, an email suggesting that we alert you all to the Steve Ashton bequest, which provides funds for architects to undertake business-related study. And I believe that that's a very um, effective program and um, encourage you to keep an eye out for it if you're interested. 
Um, but we, you know, we can't all study business, and um, we but we all do need to have some degree of financial literacy. Um, the directors of practices among us, but also I think employees. Uh, so today we have Gordana Milosevska here to help us explore this issue. Um, I'm just going to turn off the screen sharing for a minute. There we go. Okay, so. So Gordana is a chartered accountant with an intimate understanding of architectural practice. She's the founding director of management for design um, and works with architects, engineers and design businesses to enhance their business efficiency and performance. Um, she brings a really wide range of experience to that role um, in accounting and financial control across a range of industries that have included design, hospitality, retail, security and investigation and fashion. Um, Gordana is really enthusiastic about helping businesses succeed and she's also a strong advocate for women in her own sector and in architecture. Um, here at Parlour we really appreciate the opportunities we have to work with her and we're very happy to have her here today. So welcome Gordana. Thanks so much Justine. Um, so actually something I should say is we're we're going to tweak the format a little bit today. So Gordana is going to do more of a presentation for that first 20 minutes, and then we'll move to the Q&A. So unlike some of the previous sessions, we would just had a kind of flood of questions from the beginning. But so we're going to start with asking Gordana a question, but she will probably answer that in a relatively long form. So Gordana, <laughs> you work with lots and lots of architects, and I think you've got a lot of insight into the way that many different practices operate. Um, and I think you're going to run us through the core things that you think architects need to know. And I'm also interested to what to know what you wish architects knew more about, um, what they could become better at, um, and what they're already quite good at. So take it away. Okay, and, and thank, thanks for that, Justine. I think it's um, uh, there's a lot in that in terms of a response. And I think when talking about uh, numbers and or finances, charts and graphs um, do a lot for architects rather than somebody speaking. So you'll just have to bear with me in terms of how I respond to that. And some information I can give you um, in this uh, short time that I hope can help. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the current business environment is unlike any time in the past. We're navigating through some unprecedented times. And of course, we don't have the luxury of drawing on our previous experience. There's in fact never been more uncertainty. If practices were uh, not aware of this before, they most certainly should now, cash is the lifeblood of any business. And the current crisis has completely um, has completely disrupted the flow of cash between business to business and between our clients and our business. The project-based nature of our industry just means we're more vulnerable to disruptions, which results in increasing pressure on our cash flow and our overall business's financial well-being. So what can you do to help your practice survive and succeed in this time? Well, looking at the current situation uh, as an opportunity to get your current projects completed to a high standard um, is important. And then, of course, if there's an increasing level of non-billable hours, looking for areas to make improvements in the, in the practice, for instance, increasing your knowledge base, improving systems and processes, or like you're all doing today, making a start on your financial literacy. And with this in mind, let's um, to make a start and talk about financial literacy and what that means for an architectural practice. Well, knowing where your practice stands financially is fundamental to effective decision making. Where are the numbers today and where should they be in the future? How do you drive your practice to succeed and deliver the outcomes that it's seeking? Often, it's the business leaders who will set the financial structure in place and uh, champion them. But it's up to everyone in the business to understand what they are, why they're there, and the impact each of us can have on them. Now, accessing accurate and timely information is not always easy. There's the income, the expenses, the profit margin, cash position, project performance, 
the list goes on. Once you have all this information, you then need to interpret it and understand it. Now, if you're a leader, it's your role to regularly absorb this information and to make decisions promptly. Now, these executive decisions can then be converted into activities to be completed by your team. Now, as part of a team, either as one of the leaders or as an employee, it's important to understand everything you do has an impact on the financial performance of the practice. You need to remain cognizant of this. Now, you can exercise care around these areas, even if you're not directly responsible for them. So what are these fundamental financial structures, behaviours and understanding that need to be in place for a practice to be successful? Now, one of the first thing is knowing the difference between profit and cash. Now, first things first, they're both different. Now, the profit is the practice's earnings, i.e. your revenue minus the expenses or fees minus costs. Those costs that are generally uh, there to, uh, that are there to generate, that the business incurs to generate the revenue. Profit, simply put, is a theory. Why? Well, because you can't actually spend it. Whereas cash, on the other hand, is the money the practice physically has in their bank account. This is real and can be spent. Now, which business transaction will affect the profit and cash in different ways and at different times? For example, paying salaries and wages, paying tax, purchasing computers and equipment, waiting on debtors to make a payment, or the creditors that haven't been paid yet, all affect profit and cash differently. Now, most of the time, the effect on the cash position can be delayed and occur after the change in the profit position. For example, uh, we're sitting here at the 10th of July. Say your fees for June were in the order of 500,000. Uh, you are unlikely right about now to have received any of this money. However, it's actually been reported in your profit and loss statement as fees. On the flip side, the salaries and wages that you incurred as a practice to produce those $500,000 worth of fees would definitely have been paid by now and have reduced your bank account accordingly. Both profit and cash are important and these need to be reviewed monthly. This leads to the next fundamental. How much money should a practice have in their bank account or have access to? Now, the amount of money needed in the bank account will often depend on the risk profile and the life stage of the practice. Most startups will routinely have to add additional funds, whereas established businesses may retain years worth of unpaid profits in case of a rainy day or if you're in expansion mode, the business could even be tapping into an overdraft facility. As a benchmark though, a practice should aim for one to three months worth of their average monthly expenses. So one to three months, somewhere, somewhere in between this. More than this can mean the business owes the owners money, anything less than a month's worth of expenses, unless there's a bank overdraft facility in place, of course, could mean that cash flow is a problem and can distract the practice leaders um, and, and cause unnecessary concern and pressure. Right now, in this COVID-19 environment, most practices should be content with somewhere between four to six weeks worth of expenses, um, an average of that in their bank account. Next. Reviewing your income statement and balance sheet, or multiple ones if you have them, uh, in a timely manner. That's the key as well there. Now, an income statement or a profit and loss statement is fundamental to understanding and assessing the performance of your practice. This keeps track of the income, your fees, and your expenses, i.e. the cost that your practice incurs to generate those fees. Now, the difference between the two is the profit, provided that the fees are more than the costs. Otherwise, we have a loss. Now, just being aware of this simple calculation can help every team member to better benefit the practice. The numbers are always a reflection of the decisions that were made or not made. 
and the resulting activities during the month. So, doesn't it stand to reason that if we want to change the numbers, we simply need to change the activities that cause the numbers? A balance sheet, well, this is a, simply a measure of what the practice owns and what the practice owes at a specific moment in time. Both reports are necessary and should be reviewed monthly. Uh, we often say what you measure is what you monitor and what you manage. Month in, month out, the practice leaders need to know where the business stands financially to enable them to steer it in the right direction. This naturally leads us to our next financial fundamental. And knowing what the practice's profit margin is, and also where should it be? Your profit divided by your fees is referred to as the profit margin. A well-run practice will have a margin in excess of 20%. In a professional services business like ours, now it's not uncommon that our, most of our expenses are our salaries and wages. And if these are managed and kept at somewhere around 50% of the total fees or less, then a profit margin of 20% is achievable. A profit margin between 10 and 20% is acceptable. However, this doesn't leave much room for low fee months, i.e. where you've got a break even position or a loss position, especially if they're consecutive months. Now a profit margin in excess of 30% may mean the practice uh, is an expert in its niche uh, and can command significant fees. That's typically the reason. And in some instances, uh, unfortunately, it could be that um, your people are overworked and under-rewarded. So how can we ensure that expenses don't get out of hand? Uh, uh, well, the next fundamental is to have budgets and forecasts in place. And again, to ensure these are reviewed regularly. A budget sets the tone for the year ahead and encapsulates the strategy for the practice in numbers. In setting a budget, a practice is putting a benchmark in place of expected work and associated costs. But budgets should be set annually uh, and reviewed monthly. Typically, this is done at the start of the new financial year. This is essential for forward forecasting and where you th think the practice will be in the next 12 months. Some of the considerations when um, setting a budget should be around uh, your work generated. Now that's the, um, the marketing or your business development activity of the practice, your work in hand, the number of people, the cost of those people, the cost of your overheads uh, and your current opportunities. Now, if you're not a business leader, it's still important to understand the effect you can have on the budgets. A forecast, on the other hand, is derived from reviewing the budget monthly and having a clear understanding of where the practice is now and where it's heading. Now, this is important right about now, especially given the uncertain nature of the next three to six months. Uh, this should be updated as new information comes to hand rather than altering the budget. We capture this in a forecast. So what happens when there's a discrepancy between budgets and the actual numbers? Well, our next financial fundamental is reviewing budget variances and letting these prompt improvements and budget revisions. A budget variance is the difference between the budgeted amount and the actual amount across our fees and our costs. Now, the budget variance is favourable when the actual revenue or our fees are higher than budget or the reverse when our actual expenses or our costs are less than budget. Uh, typically budget variances are caused by changes in our uh, revenue, like the fees going up or down, or sometimes um, and often unexpected uh, costs that have crept in. Um, and this can sometimes also be due to inaccurate assumptions, um, which result in um, an unreasonable baseline potentially. Variances between actual and budgeted numbers should be investigated and explained monthly. Uh, ideally, unfavourable variances should be avoided where possible, as they could negatively impact the performance of the practice. 
Now, the next financial fundamental um, is around project profitability, and I think is relevant to, to everyone, and everyone can have an impact on regardless of the level within a practice. Um, firstly, we do recommend that practices have project reporting um, in place. Uh, it's important to track fees and costs by project to ensure the projects are completed within their set budgets and are hopefully profitable. The culmination of the profit, hopefully there's always a profit rather than loss on each project, makes up the overall financial performance of the practice. Only when the business has established what the profitability of each of the practice's projects are, can it make an accurate decision about resourcing and fees moving forward. So um, we've already talked about a range, uh, a wide range of financial information, but um, one of the questions uh, probably is, how much of this should be shared with the team? Now, while every practice is different, uh, it's fundamental for the team to have access to the information they require to excel in their role. This means different things to different practices. Some will share uh, all the, the financial information they have and others limited. Leaders will share what they feel comfortable with whilst ensuring the necessary information is made available to the team to drive the practice forward and, and ensure good decision making. There's also opportunities for businesses to mentor their leaders and support them to make those um, well-informed business decisions. So how can you ensure everyone is doing their part to help the practice succeed? We recommend that every practice sets and reviews meaningful KPIs every month, key performance indicators. What gets measured can be managed and can grow exponentially. Some KPIs that a practice may want to consider uh, include the profit margin, as we uh, mentioned earlier. Um, this is your profit divided by your fees and or revenue described uh, as a percentage. There's the data days. Now this, is, this KPI is around how long does it take on average for our clients to pay their invoicing? This number as an industry benchmark should be in the order of about 75 days. Our fees per person. So this is our total fees divided by the number of people. What is that number for um, a practice? The associated cost per person. Uh, our work generated. Uh, again, that's around our marketing effort or our business development efforts as a practice. And our staff utilisation chargeable, non-chargeable hours per employee. Now, at this point, you know, most of you may be thinking there's a lot of information here to get my head around. And how can I ensure all of this is accurately measured, reported and acted on? Well, we recommend that the business works with, you won't be surprised, an accountant, um, you know, either internally or externally. Have a CFO, a head of finance, an accountant. But the reason this is necessary is because the language of business, and in fact, the architect, your architectural practice that you either own or are working in is in fact a business. The language of business is accounting. And unless you're an accountant, have studied business, um, you're probably not well versed in it and are dabbling in it. Now, some owners will have copious amounts of reports and lots of reporting going on, and yet they have no idea how to read those reports, how to interpret them, or in fact, understand them. Most leaders generally have enough to do between generating new work, designing, and ensuring existing projects are on track. Um, we believe the practice should be putting an expert in charge of this area. So as I say, whether it's an internal person or an external, it doesn't matter. This allows the business then to focus its attention and its leaders and its people on key areas that directly impact its profitability. This then frees up the directors to lead with confidence in a competitive market with the knowledge that their finances are in safe hands. So I'll take a breather now as I'm conscious of the fact that I've provided um, 
some information and I've done lots of talking and I'll pause for some um, questions, clarifications, uh, et cetera. Thank you, Gordana. Um, would I be right in saying that, that for, you know, for many of us in the audience, the question of financial literacy is, is knowing enough that we can then have conversations with, for example, people like you, accountants who actually know what they're doing. So rather than, I suppose, like we need, to, you know, architects need to know enough about engineering that they can have a reasonable, intelligent conversation without trying to do the work. Spot on, Justine. It's, it's asking for, um, I think, in the first instance, when you're presented with a set of figures, a set of reports, asking what does all of this mean? You know, there's a profit, there's a loss, there's a variance. And what does that mean? So <laughs> what does it mean to me as a business leader? What does it mean to me as a practice owner? What do I need to do as a, resu uh, as a result of the results that I've just been given? Yeah. And, then, and then more importantly, having, um, you know, having your financials now, as I say, with 10th of July, some practices may have already finalised their June figures or have a good indication because it's year end, it's probably, it'll probably take another five or 10 days to get everything completed um, from an accounting perspective. It's more about knowing um, not where we were for the month of June or for the quarter or for the year. It's more about what am I going to do into the future? What, where's the practice going in the month of July? Where's it going in the next three months, six months and beyond? Asking for forecasting. And as a result of that, what do I need to do in the practice to ensure my sustainability and in the current environment, my survival? What do I need to do? Are there the conversations that need to be had? Rather than having, all the, having the answers or thinking you need to find the answers, mm. you know, yourself with experts or having the people that know what they're talking about and interpret that information for you is I think key is as I say architects have enough to do and trying to stay on top of their finances um, if they're not don't have the confidence in the person or people that are looking after them is not the best use of their time I think everyone needs to stay in their lane <laughs> great <laughs> Okay, we've got a quick uh, question of clarification here from Nick Duggan, who's who's asking if the profit margin industry benchmark of 20%, is that net or gross? Uh, that's before tax, Nick. Before tax, yeah, before tax. Okay. And I, so, so sorry, Nick, I didn't ask you to ask that because it was quite straightforward. Um, but Sue Wittenoom's got a question about KPIs. Sue, do you want to turn on your microphone and uh, pose your question? <laughs> It's, yeah, hi Justine. Thanks, Gordana. Yeah, it's, it's a quick one too. Your um, metrics or your KPIs on fees or costs per person, Gordana, do you see that as staying as a head or as a full term, full time equivalent? Full time equivalent, Sue. Yeah, definitely full time equivalent. Yeah, that's the way. Okay, and is there, um, so, so do you want to tell us a little bit about your rationale behind that question? Uh, uh, my rationale. Look, um, any, I'm always on the lookout for any scenario that penalises a firm for um, flex roles. Mm. So, you know, the, the obvious one is uh, a, per, a part time person does not need a full time desk. Does a firm then have to carry a desk if it allocates desks? So, there might be a perception that a flex person or a part time person is going to cost me more as a practice manager because they're going to chew up resources. So I'm just wondering, is that accurately felt in the, in those KPIs? And I think the, the, those ideas around KPIs and how widely they're shared, Gordana, it would be really good to um, speak more to that in, in these times of crisis when firms might not have been sharing this information readily in the past. But if, if they're asking uh, staff to share in the burden of the risk and the uncertainty of practicing conditions. Can we talk some more about how open and transparent firms should be when employees are being asked to take sacrifices as well as the leaders? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a great question, Sue. It's a really, it's a really a good question. And it's, um, given the uncertain times we find ourselves, I don't know that necessarily um, if, if a practice has up until this point um, uh, 
not shared or shared certain information, my advice would be to stay with what you've already done. Don't start necessarily disclosing or revealing information in these uncertain times because all it does, if, if as an employee, if I didn't know what the profit margin was before, telling me what it is today, which may be a lot lower, it, I don't know that I, I will know what to do with that information. So I think in the first instance, my advice is can, can, can you start again? Continue to share the information that you have um, you have to date. I don't know that sharing any more information is necessary other than in terms of specifics around um, KPIs. That would be my advice because as I say, there's enough uncertainty already. And so giving um, employees more information about numbers and if they didn't have a benchmark before about what it was before or, or even right about now, trying to get them to understand it all now, I don't know that it's the time to do that, that would be my. That it would seems be my. to be my my understanding a very wide range of of ways practices approach how much information they share, how much they don't, how much they um, aim to make sure their employees are well educated around finance. Um, we've got a good question and a comment here from from Catherine who's joining us from the US. Catherine, do you want to talk about your own experience and then then ask your question? Catherine, yeah. a big supporter of Paula. We're very happy to hear from the US. Hi, Christine. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, um, well, first of all, the comment was that when I was a sort of an intern, I, um, first starting out, I worked for an affordable housing developer, and my boss um, really wanted the staff to be informed about finances and like wanted us to read like the 990s of the organization. And so um, the book that I put in the chat was the one that she made us read all as a staff. We were about, I guess, 10 or 12 people, um, but she made us read it all as a staff. And, you know, we had to go over it in our staff meetings probably for about three months or so, like learning what the profit and loss statements were and all of that, the cash statements. Um, so it was a really good introduction, um, something that I go back to even now. Um, and so I wanted um, Gordana to give any books or articles or websites that she's following that people should be, um, that would be good recommendations for us as we sort of think about like our finances and businesses and stuff like that. And I'm on the wow. board for a, for a nonprofit. So I'm doing some of the financial stuff and, you know, for that and thinking about how all that stuff goes together. That's a, that's a, that's a great, um, great question, Catherine. And also um, very interesting to hear that, um, all of that information was shared. Did you get to understand, or did you was she were was the practice sharing all of their information around their income statement, cash flow, etc.? Yeah, so I've actually been in in two organizations that shared. Um, so in that in that organization, it was a nonprofit, so a lot of our stuff was open. Um, you know, it's, at that time, she wanted us to really understand like the 990 and how that that for the U.S. That's the tax document that nonprofits have to submit so understanding and that's a public document so anyone can go and and if they're interested in what a nonprofit um their their financial standing for the year it's an annual document they can go and pull that from a website so she wanted us to be able to understand it as staff so that if, if people started questioning our organization we could be able to respond intelligently um and then i i was in a firm in an architecture firm um that did share maybe like on a quarterly basis um mm -hmm very high level numbers, you know, like, yes, this is what we put out for marketing and this is what we got back. And, you know, the school, the school studio, you know, profits are this percentage over last year, very high level numbers. So um, I have had both experiences where they're both shared. And, and how do you think, can I just continue to probe? Because um, I think it's, it's, um, it's probably, uh, it's not unusual, but um, more firms, I think, um, speaking in general, um, in Australia are less likely to share in detail information to anybody other than keeping it at, at leadership level. So my, um, can I ask, what insights did you get out of it and did you behave in a different manner as a result of that? And this could be that something we could um, all learn from in terms of does it in fact knowing this information uh, around a practice's profitability 
its cash flow, all the intricacies around the numbers, where it's been, where it's going potentially. Um, did you find, um, it, how did it um, um, manifest in terms of it making it a better practice potentially? What did you all do with that information? That's probably my question. Um, so I think personally, um especially like in the times now, like um, like six months ago, I was working for a firm that did a lot of hotel work. And mm -hmm. so because I was like paying attention to the economy, I was like, oh, hotels may not be a big thing for the next, you know, the rest of the year. And how's that going to affect, you know, my job and what I'm doing because, um, uh, you know, because of that sector shrinking. Um, so I think knowing knowing where the firm gets its money from you know like if your firm does hotels and schools and county municipal buildings like knowing where the firm gets its money from is helpful as a staff person because then when economies change you're going to recognize like, okay if i'm in this studio i may need to rethink or reshift or start learning about another studio um or what other things that i can be bringing to the firm if i know that my studio work is going to shrink or something like that yeah and I think that's very relevant in that. And I think um, for most part of it, most practices, and I think in Australia, do share with um, do share with their people uh, what sectors they're working on, and that that sort of for most part of and and the I think for most part of it, the projects that they're working on. So in terms of any more detail around the numbers, and I think that's tiered depending on the level that are, that they're at. So some firms will, or some practices will tend to uh, share that um, financial information at a high level in terms of their, um, you know, their, their fees for the month, for the quarter, for the year. Um, and sometimes even at a, um, at a studio level, profitability um, for the studio is generally kept to the leaders in most, uh, for most part of it, I think. Profitability uh, on a project by project level, I've seen uh, happen uh, occasionally. And typically it's around the fees and costs associated with the project that um, you're working on. And especially that project that you can in fact influence. Uh, and if budgets are set by project, then I think you have the opportunity uh, to influence uh, where it goes, as long as you stay within the budget. Um, if there's scope creep variation, flagging that I think is a is super important to um, so that uh, you know sort of the senior architect, the associate, whoever's in charge uh, for you, whoever you're reporting up to, uh, can then make a decision um, and go back to the client if if necessary. But I think staying within understanding what the budget is um, for your project is probably um, sort of sort of at a, at a lower level, what you would tend to know and how you can influence um, the financials of a practice. Mm -hmm. I've had um, the director of a smaller practice tell me that um, he, um, I guess a few years ago now, um, decided to really kind of try and open the books a lot more and found the whole culture of the practice shifted in a way that was, um, in his opinion, for the better, because it um, just people were kind of aware of where the energies were going and what, anyway, but, uh, but there's also a kind of downside to it that we, we spoke about before we started is that sometimes, sometimes practices can, can sort of share financials as a way to kind of engender competition. And as you say, mean that, um, people aren't actually logging the hours they're putting in. And so there's a, there's a potentially a very positive side to, uh, to sharing carefully. And then there's also a dark side. And I wondered if you wanted to. Yeah. And, and I think um, it, it's really um, that the tone is set by the business leaders mm. or by the business leader, quite frankly, and, and their risk profile. So there's no right or wrong answer in terms of how much a, a practice should share. Um, I think it's important to stay, to, to know, for you to understand that what impact you can have on a project um, and what does that mean, how your contribution means something. Yeah. As I said, I've had, um, you know, I work with um, lots of clients over the years. Some have shared lots of financial data 
some um, very little mm. uh, in terms of what does that mean to each individual and whether the practice is run. I mean, there's this level you'd suggest a level of transparency, a level of confidence, but I mean, sometimes it's, if you don't actually understand what it all means, it's like, so what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that my example was, I think it was part of a whole program of trying to skill everybody up in that regard. Mm. Um, there's a question here from Ree who, who can't unmute, so is asking me to ask it. Um, just uh, another kind of practical question, asking if you can recommend any software for tracking project financial performance. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's, um, it's not an answer that... Um, there's so many different software packages uh, on the market that it's very difficult without knowing the size of the practice, um, how it uses the software, et cetera, what that short answer is. I think there's over 40 um, software packages uh, from what, you know, speaking to my director of business management systems yesterday, who's building a tool that will be like, it'll be a free online tool shortly to be a system selector where you can log in your information and it'll spit out, you know, the three software pieces that, that are ideal. But um, in terms of project management software, uh, there's things like just off the cuff, there's things like Harvest, um, Workflow Max, uh, Pro Workflow, and that's for, um, and that'd be intertwined with a package like Zero to track your financials. And that's suitable for uh, practice anywhere from, you know, one to 40 people, something like that. Anything over that, you'd be looking at an ERP solution uh, and that could be something like BQE Core, um, just as a uh, off the cuff, really. But otherwise, there, there will be um, an online tool shortly at Management Core Design that will allow, it'll be a free tool where, as I say, you can put in the information um, around the practice and that'll give you three recommendations. Okay. Um, um, Sue Wittenoom is back with another question. Sue. It's just, I'm still harping on about that um, KPI, thinking about dashboards in general. And Godani, your comments about what was good cash flow um, and the weeks of, in the, of expenses in the bank, that was helpful to gauge. Um, can you do the same for the fees and the costs per full-time equivalent person so people can get a feel for what expectations should be? Mm -hmm. Um, so, with respect to fees, uh, so on average, uh, a full-time equi full equivalent should be able to generate somewhere between 200 to 250,000 of fees per annum. Yeah. So, a practice of say, um, say 15 people. Uh, if you have a practice, yeah, of about 15 people, you should be able to generate. Uh, somewhere in the in the order of three million in terms of total fees, and if you're after um, uh, twenty percent margin, your costs need to be in the order of um, sort of two point. Okay, we've got a comment here um, from Matt Watson about. Um, um, how sharing data, as you say, Gordana, can sometimes be unsettling. So, Matt, do you want to turn oh, on thanks. your microphone? Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Jesse. I was just thinking, um, you know, I share as much information with my team that I think they need to know, um, but I'm also very careful that when I share information with them that it's shared in a sense that um, they know what I'm expecting them to be able to influence because you can share you can share information with people that puts them in a place where they actually have no agency in that situation and so particularly in times like these you might share the crisis as it is and yeah. more particularly more junior staff members are just watching the bus crash mm -hmm. you know they've got no way of, of influencing it and you're just you're adding anxiety on anxiety and there's no good reason for it so i think it's very important um i often say to my team look this is for your information but it is not your responsibility like i'm i'm managing this for the team but i need you to be aware of what i'm managing not not to um not to put it onto you it's not your responsibility so you've got to be very careful when when people are just you know they're worried about you know paying their rent let alone how your business is going to to put that onto people 
Oh, you're spot on, Matt. You're spot on. And that's why I say if um, you were sharing limited information in the past, um, continue to share that, or whatever that means. I call it limited, but whatever that information you were sharing, um, financial information in the past, I think if you could continue to share that, whatever that is, um, I think that's that that then provides that um, consistency uh, for and 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 that's something that um, that anything that's not consistent right about now um, can be unnerving and, and and unsettling. So whatever you were providing in the past, if if you were if you were in fact keeping your um, staff up to date with what your fees were for maybe you weren't sharing it monthly, maybe for the last quarter, continue to share that and how that compares to budget. Sometimes um, you can talk about we're on budget for the month, for the quarter, for the six months or for the year, or we're over or we're under. Sometimes that's enough. Did we meet the benchmark? Did we not? That's enough for most people, understanding whether or not um, we're at budget. And also I think, um, you know, talking to where um where you're going and and i mean it's an unsettling time for everybody so yeah i i agree with you matt spot on um can i have oh, gina i'm gonna have a talk um one of the things uh that i remember when i was a very recent graduate uh we had someone walking off the street and say they wanted us to do some work and my boss sort of said okay well we'll have to sit down and talk about how much it's going to cost you. And as a very recent graduate, I thought that was terribly rude. You know, um, architecture was about doing the very best and you put in heaps of time to make it the best you possibly can. And uh, we, we are kind of trained to that at architecture school. But of course, once I started doing my own work, I very quickly came across when I didn't talk to people about the money and then I, I presented them a bill, they were like, Oh no, that's more than I expected. But I think architecture does have, have this kind of idea that we know time is money, but actually time is what we want to put in to do the very best. And I think it's one of those kind of um, paradoxes of, of, of being an architect. Do, do you find that? Do you find that when you start talking profit and loss, architects want to go, I don't want to talk about that. I just want to be the very best architect. Absolutely, absolutely, Jill. And, um, you know, some practices don't actually track their, um, their profitability by project. They simply have a look at how the practice performed for the month, for the quarter, for the year. Um, you know, they had fees of X and a profit um, Y. And, and we know that the, the total of the fees, the total of the cost, the total of the profit is a combination of all of the projects that we've worked on for the month, for the quarter, for the year. So it's made up of all those individual blocks. So to basically be able to understand how we got to, the, to our total fees, our total costs and our total profit, we need to be able to understand and dissect each project. Now, some, um, some practices aren't interested in that because they say, oh, we know there's a mixture of profitable, and loss making and even break even projects. Um, and we're doing those, those loss making projects we're working on because we're, uh, we're going to be winning an award for that or we're going to get the next and the following project from that same client. So um, I think uh, my, my advice is that it's better to know rather than not know. It's great to understand and hopefully if you're making a profit as a practice, fantastic. Uh, however, understanding how you got there, I think, is important as well. Um, I think to your point around uh, not, um, not valuing our time, but it's about um, rather than playing the price game, I think we should be playing the value game. And this approach around, you know, we're going to bill for the number of, you know, for a number of hours or our hourly rate is, $200, $300 per hour, whatever it is, depending on the level. Uh, and, and, and then trying to explain that on projects that are worked on it in an hourly capacity, trying to then explain that to a client 
I think, in my opinion, makes no sense. Uh, because, and I'll, I'll tell you why, it sort of reminds me of a story that, um, that I'd heard about, you know, one of those parables about a woman who uh, approached Picasso in a restaurant. She asked him to scribble something on a napkin or do a drawing, you know, could you please draw something for me? And, um, you know, Picasso, I'm not Picasso, but I think he did this, right? And he gave that to her and she said, oh, thank you so much. That was, oh, that was great. I'm, um, I'm really grateful. And then he did this and he gave her another bit of paper that had a number on it. And she said, oh, well, what's this? And she said, and he said, that's my bill. And she said, for what? And he said, for the drawing that I just gave you. She said, but that just took you a second. He said, no, it didn't. That took me 40 years. So again, with our time, I don't know that we should be able, we should be um, trying to convert that into an hourly rate because it's taken 10, 20, 30 years of training to be able to do whatever it is that we produce. The fact that we can produce it in an hour, six hours, 20 hours, whatever it is, it's because we've had that training or you've had, not me, you have had that 10, 20, 30 years of training as an architect. So trying to, um, I, I, I think it's important to be able to put value on our time and understand that it's value we're providing, Jill, to your question. Um, you know, we need to value our time. We need to value our people's time. We, we need to value our practice and what we provide and what is that outcome that our clients get as a, as a result of what we do. And that doesn't happen for free because we've put in 10, 20, 30 years of time to get to where we're at and be able to actually provide what we're providing to our clients. Yeah, um, uh, Nicole Hardman in the chat has sort of said we have trouble properly valuing our creativity. And I think that cuts to the kind of core of it really. Yes. Yeah. As you say, it's just a bit of, it's paper with some drawings on it, you know, with drawings on it. What That doesn't mean terribly much, but actually it does. Actually it does. Makes it what we contribute, yeah. Okay, well, we're nearly at an end. Look, the chat's been quite quiet, I have to say. I think people yes. are really absorbing this incredibly valuable information, Gordana. I do wonder, um, I mean, I totally understand the point about, um, you know, not, uh, not bamboozling employees with information that they can't manage. But I'm also thinking from the perspective of a younger practitioner yeah. who understands that they need to know about financial matters as they develop their career, um, you know, if they want to go out on their own, if they want, if, if they aspire to become a director, like this, how do, um, how can our kind of younger colleagues um, sort of step up or, or learn what they need to learn in a kind of ongoing way if they're in an environment where they're not given financial information in their workplace, what are, how do they? Um, yeah. I think that's good, um, Justine. I think it's important for all architects to have an understanding of how finance affect the business. And the level of understanding, I think, needs to be commensurate on the level at which you're at for the time being. So, for example, as a graduate architect, simply having an understanding of how getting your time sheet in on time um, is a big deal. So, not only about you getting paid, so financially it's an impact for you. So, getting it in means you'll get paid. Um, but also understanding that uh, you putting your time down then enables the practice to generate the fees, to then understand what the cost of the project was or projects were that you worked on and then be able to assess their profitability. As a senior architect, understanding um, what the current profitability of um, the projects that you're work or the project you're working on and how you can improve or maintain it and then perhaps at an associate level, understanding how um, when you're working across multiple projects, understanding the fees, how the hours are tracking, the profitability, scope creep, um, et cetera. And so I think asking questions in the first instance, um, Justine, typically there's a, a finance or an accounting person that they could probably go to and ask questions of, but also to um, you know, their directors having, you know, asking the questions 
around, I don't have this information. What, what, are the, what is the budget on this project? Um, what can I do uh, to influence the outcome? I mean, ultimately, uh, architecture is a business. And the more architects are able to make a connection between the design process and the numbers, the better place they'll be to help the practice rather than um, hinder it. So then the business can take on larger and um, more ambitious projects. Of course, as a director or a business leader, having a solid understanding of the current um, practice finances and its position uh, can in fact give you peace of mind and the confidence to focus on the aspects of the work that they're best at. There's also an argument, I think, for a kind of broader industry-wide, you know, the profession as a whole just stepping up in this regard. So we're talking about individual businesses, but, you know, I mean, this kind of endless, you know, the sort of race to the bottom on fees, things like that, you know, it's, it's not doing anyone any good. And so I think if we're all just a little bit more literate, we might be able to um, manage some of that. Matt Watson has just um, made the point here that even if... Um, financial information isn't generally shared, often leaders will be happy to share it if you show you're interested. So again, that would be another tip for young players. Um, well, we're right on time. That was fabulous. Um, I think it was, you know, I certainly learned something, so that's good. <laughs> These are... <laughs> Jill, do you have anything else you would like to... Um... No, I, 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 I think it's uh, terribly important that we do understand money in, money out, etc. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. And it is also really important that we value that, that how added value to projects is, is mm. seriously acknowledged. Mm. And we should and individually, individually, we can all be contributing to that mm. rather than doing freebies and undercutting uh -huh. fees. I think valuing people's time and people's labour is a very strong thread that runs through everything Paula does, even if we're not you know, financial experts. That sense of valuing people's work and people's labour is absolutely fundamental. So um, thank you, Gordana. I thought it was incredibly helpful. And um, I hope you'll give us permission to have a recording of that up online because I think it's the sort of presentation that people will be able to go back to usefully. And although the um, chat was quite quiet, we're now getting lots of people coming through and saying thank you and it was very valuable. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, in terms of parlor announcements, um, we uh, our, our next session next Friday will be about mentoring and we've got... Um, Sonia Sarangi and Alison Cleary joining us to discuss mentoring, which I think will be very interesting and great. I uh, hope to see many of you there again. Um, and we've also set up a new event series, um, which is specifically aimed at students and recent graduates um, at a kind of um, Net, well, you know, I never like the networking word, but that's basically what it is. Um, it's being led by students, led by Sarah Mayer and Bronwyn Main. Um, and it will be Monday lunchtime, so it's called Midday Monday, um, and it's really just an hour. There'll be a quick chat, and then they'll be breaking people into those breakout rooms as we do with the salons. The core idea is to help build connections across, um, especially now we're all in lockdown in Victoria again, but to help students kind of build connections and build networks and uh, build a kind of camaraderie and solidarity across the country. So if you're a student or a grad, please um, look that up. And if you're not, please encourage the students and grads in your life to participate. I think it'll be really good. Um, and it's also, I'm very happy that uh, we've provided the platform, but Sarah and Bronwyn are running with it and leading it and um, directing that. So um, yes, join us. And I don't have to tell you to do the survey. Now, now Jill just has to analyze it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, have it's a lovely lots of fun. <laughs> Thank you again, Gordana. Let's do a clap. Thank you. Everybody. And right. um, see you all again, all again next week. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Bye.